Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anurekha Charivag, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss the module titled The Middle Pigeon Thesis and its Limitations. This module is within the paper titled Agrarian Social Structure and Change. This paper is coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur, IIM, Kolkata. In this module, we are going to have a synoptic view of the debate of the Middle Pigeon Thesis. We are going to look into the writings of Hamza Alvi and Eric Wolf. Further, we will also look into how the Middle Pigeon class is referred to as one of the most radical class within the whole agrarian social structure. Further, while focusing on the debate on this thesis, we will also look into the relationship to caste, ethnicity, political ideology, nationalism and so on. Further, it becomes very important for us to understand how within India the whole discourse of green revolution also has a very great impact on the way we understand middle peasant thesis. The middle peasant thesis and its limitations. Since Marx, the question of peasantry and the role in social change has been a point of contestation for scholars on diverse ideological persuasions. Notwithstanding Marx's caricature of the 19th century French small holding peasants as potatoes in a sack and the French nation as a sack of potatoes, his views on peasantry were fairly ambiguous. For him, while the small holding peasants were conservative and reactionary in nature, the agrarian proletarians formed a radical class who could corroborate with the radical urban proletarians in the latter's revolutionary struggle. Similar views were expressed by Engels in his The Peasant Question in France and Germany. Moreover, both of them were concerned about the political role the landless peasantry could play in the proletarian revolution. A major impetus to the peasant question came with the works first of Lenin in 1899 in a seminal work, The Development Capitalism in Russia, and then more substantially in his 1920 work, Preliminary Draft Thesis on the Agrarian Question, and later on Mao Tsung 1926 and 1933 writings, namely Analysis of Classes in a Chinese Society and how to differentiate the classes in rural areas respectively. After periods of relative neglect, the works of these two activist intellectuals and peasantry were revisited by a few scholars of Marxist persuasion to understand social change in the third world countries. What role the various classes of peasants played became the point of concern, the most crucial of which was the role of the so-called middle peasants or Marxist potato in a sack played in the peasant struggle. Needless to say, there were clear disagreements between scholarly positions even when they followed similar ideological underpinnings. This debate became famous as the Middle Pisan Thesis. Beginning with the works of Lenin and Mao and their impact on Russian and Chinese revolutions respectively, this module will present a synoptic view of the debate on the Pisan question. The works of both Lenin and Mao went beyond mere academic theorizing as both of them were simultaneously writing for political actions in Russia and China respectively. Here while Lenin and the classical Marxist concern where industrial proletarians took for granted the conflict between the bourgeois and the proletarians, his theorization also included peasantry for political action. Two of his important works, The Development of Capitalism in Russia and the Preliminary Draft Thesis on the Agrarian Question, which he wrote for the Second Communist International, look critically at the classifications within peasantry. Lenin took into consideration the specificity of the development of capitalist relations of production in the Russian countryside and the resultant emerging social structure. This was significant for him in order to create strategies for class collaborations for revolutionary praxis, putting at the backdrop the degree of ownership of land alienation and the relations of production Lenin suggests six classes within Russian peasantry, namely big landowners. They exploit wage labor, small and sometimes middle peasantry, however they do not themselves engage in manual labor. This classes the direct uh, descendants of feudal lords, rich financial magnates or a mixture of both the categories. Lenin brands them as exploiters and parasites. He argues that the revolutionary proletarians should unreservedly confiscate the property of these big landlords without any compensation. Big peasants. They are capitalist entrepreneurs in agriculture and use the lands for profit making. Although the big peasants themselves do, do the supervisory activities, their farms are tilled by hired laborers. Lenin argues that this class continues the determined enemy of the revolutionary proletariat and needs to be neutralized by the latter. Middle peasants. 
they are small farmers who cultivate their own or rented small plots of land, but under capitalist production system, in good years this class produce a marginal surplus. In terms of political leanings, it might follow the bourgeois, as both of them have similar world views towards ownership of private property. However, the middle peasants can be made a party to the proletariat if their specific disabilities like rent seeking by the landlords or mortgages are taken care of. Small peasantry. They are the small scale tillers who need who till their own uh, rented uh, plots of land for self consumption. They do not hire labor outside. They do not hire outside labor. However, this class is highly dependent on the big landowners for the use of commons in lieu of doing unpaid service at the latter's pace. Small peasantry along with classes uh, E and F form the majority of population in Russia and Lenin argues also the most exploited ones in the rural areas. So, these three classes form the backbone of urban proletariat led revolutions in the countryside. semi proletariats are peasants. They obtain the livelihood both by tilling tiny plots of land and working as wage laborers for big peasants and industrial enterprises. Although they might own some plots of land, they are not self-sufficient. Mostly the conditions are closer to that of agricultural proletariat. F. Agricultural proletariat. They are wage laborers who obtain the livelihood by working for big peasants of capitalist persuasion. Lenin emphasizes that organization of this class independent of all other rural population should be the main concern for the communist parties. The above classification of Lenin can be further condensed into two groups namely that of exploiters consisting of A and B and the exploited consisting of D, E and F with the middle peasants staying uneasily in between. Notwithstanding the classificatory schema of Lenin on the role of peasantry in revolution, his thesis more or less provides a vanguard to the communist party in general and the urban industrial proletariat in particular. Following his above classification, Lenin provided a two-page, two-stage thesis on the peasant question. In stage one, the big peasants, kulaks, and capitalist farmers, along with classes D and D, E, and F, would struggle against the big landowners to establish capitalism as a hegemonic mode of production. However, in stage two, the exploited classes D, E, and F would revolt against the kulaks for further socialization of the means of production. This would pave the path for a socialist mode of production. In this two-stage thesis, Lenin concerns towards leadership capabilities of the middle peasantry in revolution remains ambiguous. According to him, the middle peasantry could become a part of the revolutionary struggle if their property relations are not altered in a drastic way and the social position is not threatened with the proletariat revolution. However, he also considered the middle peasantry as a transitory category and argued that with further development of capitalist relations in the countryside, this class would most probably get merged with the exploited classes. The other major theorist of Marxist persuasion to theorize on the peasant question, Chinese leader Mao. Like Lenin, Mao's thesis on the peasantry came from a specific case study of China and its rural social structure. However, in the analysis of the classes in Chinese society, Mao discusses his broader schema in classifying the entire population of China into various categories to build wide ranging coalitions between classes and to differentiate between what he considered real fronts and real enemies of the revolution. Mao classified the peasantry into five groups, namely A, the landlords. They own land but do not engage in self-cultivation, rather they give their lands on rent and extract you serious rents from the peasants and tenants. They might also be engaged in money lending and industry and commerce. However, exploitation of other peasants uh, for uh, rent seeking forms a significant part of their income. Mao argues that even the members of the peasant society who help the landlords in exploitation of the peasants need to be considered as part of the landlord class. He classifies the Chinese bar laws, officials, local tyrants and evil gentry as being part of this class. In China, this class had its own armed forces, the rich peasants. This group as a rule owns land, but some might own a part of the land and take in rent from others. Few rich peasants might not own all lands, but take on rent land for agriculture. They have better means of production, including availability of adequate liquid capital compared to other peasant classes. They might also engage in manual activities themselves, but mostly they rely on exploitation of hired labor to get the work done. Efforts from farm activities, the rich peasants also engage in money lending, industry, commerce and management. 
they might also manage the village commons through which they control the lives of the other peasants, the middle peasants. They own land and sometimes take rent on land. All of them have a fair amount of farm implements. They derive their incomes wholly or mostly from their own labor. As a rule, neither they hire laborers nor get hired by others. However, they might get exploited by the rich peasants and landlords from whom the middle peasants obtain various types of loans. The poor peasant, D. Some of them own tiny plots of land for cultivation, while others do not own anything at all. They own a few farm implements and mostly they work as tenants on the other land and get exploited in the process. They have to do away with the large proportion of the produce as rent and loan payments to the landlords and rich peasants. Many a times they also hire themselves out for manual labor. E. The worker. This group, according to Mayo, which includes the farm laborers, are the most exploited in class in Chinese countryside. They own no land, no or farm implements and earn their livelihood by working for others. In this two-stage process, two peasant question, Lenin does not give much emphasis to the middle peasantry as a radical class. However, for Mayo, conditions in China were somewhat different. The development of capitalism in China was minimal and being a semi-colonial country had its own difficulties. Therefore, he does not give much significance to a role to the capitalist farmers as a revolutionary class. His point of departure was to understand the rate of exploitation which the relations of production in a semi-feudal society sustained. Through the process of classification, he argued that both the landlords and the rich peasants are anti-revolutionary, while poor peasants and workers are revolutionary. The middle peasants, owing to its condition of relative independence, might form the part of revolutionary struggle because even with its relative self-sufficiency, self -sufficiency, that class did not see a progressive mobility for itself. Nevertheless, Mao's report on an investigation of a peasant movement in Hunan of 1927 presents the poor peasantry as a smooth revolutionary class, both in terms of providing leadership as well as forming a part of the Red Army. Eventually, the coordination between the four revolution classes ensured that China witnessed a successful peasant revolution in 1949. Middle peasantry as a revolutionary class, Hamza, Alvi and Eric Wolf. In 1950s and 60s, saw a number of revolutionary movements taking place in third world countries like Mexico, Cuba, Algeria and Vietnam. All these countries were primarily agrarian societies with a fairly large population of peasants. Challenge for the social scientists of this period was to understand a phenomena which did not fall neatly into the categorization of classical Marxist articulation of industrial proletariats as a revolutionary. Following primarily a Marxist perspective in the 1960s, Hamza Alvi and Eric Wolf revisited Lenin and Mao's proposition on the present question in relation to China and Russia respectively. Wolf argues that there are three conditions, economic, social and political, under which peasantry would revolt against this exploiter. Economic conditions might include, among others, alienation of peasantry from the lands, fall in prices of agricultural products and an increase in dependence on external credits at usurious, usurious rate of interest. The social conditions might include disintegration of social relations between kin groups due to increased commercialization of production and distribution of resources, reduction in the value attached to the achieved as well as ascribed status of prominent peasant households, and the growth in interaction between the village and the outside world. The last one could happen owing to the increase in communication networks, migrations, military service and wage labor. The third condition is political. Under this condition, the peasant class might see themselves powerless vis-a-vis -vis outside political forces, whether state or capital, which remains beyond their control. These three conditionalities, according to Alvi and Wolf, make or break away, break the revolutionary chances of the peasants. However, the above conditions have different impacts on the different classes of peasants. Wolf further argues that the rich peasants are more suitable stances than other classes. Rich classes of uh, peasants become employers of others, start their own money lending enterprises and get co-opted within the urban bourgeois. On the other side of the spectrum are the poor peasants. This class is hit hard with the adverse changes in its socio-economic and political institutions. But the absolute dependence on the rich peasants for the livelihood do not provide them an opportunity, at least during the initial stages, to revolt directly against the employers. On the contrary, it is a class of the middle peasants working on their own lands with their household labor who become the vanguard of peasant movements. The relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the rich peasants and landlords give them tactical advantage over the other peasant classes to lead revolutions.
the tactical advantage the middle presents is historical significant as any drastic change in the economic or social or political processes could adversely impact the survival as an independent class of peasants Commercialization of agriculture brings two paradox in the lives of the middle peasantry. One, owing to commercialization, the traditional bonding between the households gets strained. However, the positive side of it lies in the attachment of the middle peasantry to the land, which helps it to move on two boats: one on urban economy and polity, other on rural naturalness. The urban-rural linkages these paradoxes create make the middle peasants transmitters also of urban unrest and political ideas in rural areas. This process makes them revolutionary. Thus, Wolf argues that it is not just the growth of urban industrial proletariat who is the bearer of liberation actions; rather, it is the growth of an industrial proletariat still in contact with its rural roots, which makes them revolutionary. Using the criterion of both economic deprivation under changing conditions and social changes emerging out of it, Hamza Alvi in his work Peasants and Peasants and Revolution argues that it is neither the rich nor the poor peasants and agricultural proletariats who are the vanguard of peasant unrest. The reason behind the patron-client relationship, which not only binds the two groups into an exploitative relationship, but also because of this relationship, provides a sense of security to the latter groups in the rural socio-political economic structure. He suggests that the vanguards are the independent, self-cultivating middle peasants, primarily owing to their independent status outside the landlord-rich peasant-poor peasant agricultural proletariat relationship. The household commodity production and consumption at a relatively independent level makes them see things from a different perspective. Alvi suggests that in the beginning, the middle peasants deliver the initial impetus to the peasant movements by providing a radical leadership. Once the ground is ready and the poor peasants and agricultural proletariats see gain for themselves in the struggle against the masters, they plunge into revolutionary action. Thus, according to Alvi, the true uh, was true of Russia under Lenin as well as China under Mao. Both Lenin and Mao galvanized the peasantry through their precise leadership. Nevertheless, he, he argues they were not instigators of these revolutions. The same was true of the Tibhaga and the Telangana movements in India. Meanwhile, it was Lenin's overemphasis on the rural bourgeois on one side and agrarian proletariat on the other, which overshadowed radical leadership of the middle peasants. Similarly, Mao's emphasis on the revolutionary participation of the poor peasantry, Alvi claimed, was more to toe the official line of Stalin-controlled communist international than presenting a realistic picture of the actual happenings in Chinese revolution. Notwithstanding the confusions for Alvi, the class position of the middle peasantry betrays his revolutionary potential. As a complete communist revolution would take away the ownership over private property to protect which the middle peasants jump to revolts in the first place. So the middle peasants can never lead a revolution. Once the more exploited classes take active participation, the middle peasantry back out of the struggle. This is where we find radical difference between middle peasant thesis of Alvi on one side and Wolf on the other, who argued that. Middle peasant is a revolutionary class. Tom Brass argues that genealogy of middle peasant thesis can be traced to the works of China's peasant economy, to which James Scott moral economy subaltern studies groups peasant subaltern do a complementary job. But the middle peasant thesis of Alvi and Wolf were contested by several scholars, both Marxist and non-Marxist. The criticisms were made on a the classificatory potential of definitions of the middle peasant. B. The suitability of a class analysis in a country like India without bringing into focus the role of caste and the state. C. The role of nationalist movement in the early 20th century under the leadership of Congress and Gandhi. In the next section, we will discuss the debate as it took place in India after Alvi and Wolf publication. The limitations of the Middle Peasant thesis. One of the earliest dissenter to the application of the Middle Peasant thesis in India was Barrington Moore Jr. In his highly influential as well as controversial work, The Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, Moore Jr. argued that mere classification of population into classes and labeling them as revolutionary or anti-revolutionary hinges on being naive. Radical politics goes beyond mere class alienation. One needs to understand the structures of power that underlying class actions in historical time and space. These structures of power conclude, apart from economic factors, the religious and political too. Now, Moore's junior ideas on Indian caste system as an hindrance to revolutionary uh, upheaval by peasants was much critiqued by Indian scholars for being dogmatic. However, his method of bringing both economic and non-economic factors into analysis determined the debate on the radical role of the middle peasantry in India. 
Preceding more Jr's work on India, another American social scientist, Daniel Thorner, at the height of Green Revolution, enthusiasm to classified peasantry in India into three classes, Malik, Kisan and Masood. The Malik's could be absentee rent-seeking landlords as well as capitalist farmers. The primary purpose was to maximize profit through market and non-market transactions. The Kisan, according to Thorner, could be of two types, one who owns a land and get adequate surplus for self-sufficiency, the second smallholder peasants who might rent in land to make the ends meet. Third category of peasants, Thorner calls them Masdur, or loosely translated as workers. They could mean poor tenants, sharecroppers, landless laborers. These groups work on other people's land to earn a livelihood. The classification of Thorner was most or less accepted by other scholars with minor variations. For example, David Hardiman keeps the same categories as Thorner, but divides the persons according to the plot of land old. Lloyd and Susan Rudolph follows a non-Marxist approach and term the middle peasant as a bullock capitalist. These bullock capitalists, according to Rudolf, were not of the typical middle peasant of the colonial period who used to cultivate his farm with the household labor and only for subsistence. These middle peasants were the product of the Green Revolution. This group tills its land using traditional bullock car technology and meanwhile they also use all the available resources of the Green Revolution technologies to get a surplus from the market. However, neither Thorner nor Hardiman nor Rudolf discuss the radical nature of peasant classes in their work. In post-colonial period, uh, Lennonberg, using the case of Maratha peasants, argues that the radical nature of peasant, uh, middle-class peasantry has changed to demand more of government schemes for them than any revolutionary activities as the middle peasants have changes. At a different ideological plane, taking Thornton's classification of peasant classes in India and using them to understand peasant movements in late colonial India, Dhanagre suggests that middle peasant theses of Albi and Wolf are essentially flawed at two levels. One, the middle peasants are neither independent nor self-sufficient in the present economic structure. That dependency on the village money lenders, landlords and rich peasants for cash and crop loans make them equally dependent on these more powerful groups in the village than is acknowledged by both Alvi and Wolf. Second, the middle peasants constitute a heterogeneous mixture of peasant classes, which large variation in the ownership and control over land as means of production. This heterogeneity makes the middle peasant much weaker in terms of class solidarity as different groups within middle peasantry have different class interests and relationship at the level of inter and intra-class. However, unlike the middle peasant classes, both the rich peasants and poor peasants and agrarian proletariat have a more definite class position. Therefore, at the time of mobilization, their classes show a strong tendency to a clear class action. Following Lenin's two stage theory, Dhanagre argued that the Telangana movement in 1946-51, before India's independence, for it was the rich peasants who in alliance with the small peasants and agricultural laborers fought against the Nizam of Hyderabad. But as soon as the struggle reached the second stage, in the post-independence stage, wherein more exalted groups began demanding active land distribution among all small prisons and agricultural laborers, the rich prisons turned against their former partners. With the help of Indian Army, the communist movement of the small prisons and agricultural laborers was suppressed with impunity. Therefore, it is not the middle prisons which led the path for radical resurrections, insurrections in colonial India. Kathleen Gog, in a study on the prison struggles in South India, also argues on similar lines of those of Dhanagre. These two scholars attempted to debunk the radicalism of middle peasant as suggested by radical class thesis of Alavi and Wolf by revisiting these movements as of Alavi to show the analytical discrepancy in the latter's argument. Jackers, after surveying the definitions of the middle peasants from angels onwards, argues that uh, on the scale of land ownership and relations of production, the middle peasantry forms a highly heterogeneous category. It would be rather difficult and futile to consider it as a class and expect it to engage in class struggles, as was being done by his proponents. In the Indian context, Jack has argued that one needs to understand the historical sociology of the period to understand present activities. For example, while Tibaga movement in Bengal and poor peasants and landers laborers fought the landlords, it was not the case either in Telangana movement or in others. Agreed in substance with the conclusion of Gog and Dhanagre on Telangana movement, he has also looked into other peasant movements of the same period, namely the Gandhian Satagra, Champaran, Kheda, Bardoli. According to him, in all these movements, it was the rich peasants coming from dominant caste of the region who provided initial leadership for existing property relations were not suiting to their ambitions given the increase commercialization of agriculture. He proposed the concept of dominant peasantry to understand Gandhian peasant movement.
Dominant peasantry, according to him, refers to the oligarchy of rich and a well of peasants belonging to a respectable caste who hold either as owners or tenants of the bulk land rights in each village. Unlike other caste groups, the dominant peasant caste have wide ranging leadership networks which become useful in peasant mobilization to advance their class interests. Therefore, following uh, Jackers, we can say that it is not just the unchanging nature of traditional Indian peasantry which made them docile and not fit for revolution, as Barrington Moore Jr. argued. Instead, it was the nature of dominant coalitions in the countryside which controlled the growth and spread of peasant unrest to fit in its class interests. Subscribing to the dominant coalition thesis of Jackers but making a distinction between the peasant movements of the colonial period with that of the post colonial period, TK Uman presents the Weberian schema of class, status, and party to understand peasant struggles in India. Women argues that a fundamental change happened when the country became independent. For example, he suggests that during the colonial period, prison movements were basically part of the larger national struggle. The stated goal of these struggles was to get rid of the colonial power and therefore the prison issues were not given a central position either by Gandhi and his Congress party. The reason for some involvement of the prison issues into the mega plans was to build a broad coalition based, um, was to build broad based coalitions between prisons and urban intelligentsia. Therefore, once the stated goals of the movement leaders were achieved, the struggles of the prisons were, were given and let go. This change in the post-colonial period as a common enemy in form of the colonial state ceased to exist. Now, the struggles between the various constituents of the Indian nation itself. Women opinions that agrarian movements in India are also, are also caste and communal mobilizations with specific political ideologies underlying their approaches. Therefore, social scientists need to go beyond simple classification of peasants in terms of class in India as this would provide an incomplete picture. Taking into consideration his schema of an interlinked structure of caste and status and caste, the role of political parties that will lead to a particular type of mobilizations, women presented a table for evaluation of peasant movement and the position of the middle peasants in it, which is represented in the following table. So, depending upon their caste position and the issues involved, the middle peasants in India might choose a radical or reformatory path for struggle. But this is not like, this is not a law-like schema as Alvi and Wolf proposed. Students, in conclusion to this module, middle peasant thesis and its limitations, we have discussed about how Hamza Alvi and Eric Wolf have referred to the middle peasant as one of the most radical groups within the agrarian social structure. But this argument was mostly drawn from their work in Russia and China. If we have to understand how scholars in India have looked at the middle peasant thesis, we need to understand that scholars on India in terms of dialogue of Wolf and uh, Alvi have referred to and debated extensively and engaged with the idea of radical middle peasant thesis. In India, on the other hand, many scholars have argued such as Dhanagre, they have argued that it was the rich peasant who placed a very important role in the whole peasant mobilization. It was the rich peasant in terms of caste and class that dominated the peasant movements in India. Therefore, there is no consensus among scholars in India as to whether the middle peasant is radical or not.